This is a radio broadcast addressed from the League of Nations on the global war effort against the Morgana threat, where we report the recent happenings amongst the major nations contributing to the defense of our united front. I am your speaker, Amarok Leo Mouse, but you may refer to me as Commissar, or simply the speaker, whichever you or your government prefers. This week marks the transitional week from November into December. However, much happened in the final days of November, and the Morgana seemed to be getting bolder in their attacks on humanity. Despite that, nations can still be seen working together in these trying times. First up, news from the League itself. Following last week's announcement and formation of the International Naval Protection Force, members of the League reconvened this week to discuss further policy, more specifically regarding the use and transportation of Morgana technology. There was much arguing and debate, but in the end, League member nations resolved with a 54% majority that INPF vessels in possession of captured Morgana technology were to deliver said devices only to League-authorized ports. Otherwise, said Morgana technology was to be regarded as contraband. It was further stated that INPF officers were forbidden from using Morgana technology for their home nation's exclusive benefit. If insight from the Morgana technology could benefit humanity's defense as a whole, then it should be shared among everyone. Rules for enforcing this resolution, and penalties for violation of it, were left artfully vague. Following that update from the League comes news from the Axis, more particularly Germany. The Germans considered Mussolini's efforts to turn the Balkans to his will over the last several weeks, and they concluded that it was a problem best solved directly. No competing for the favors of Prince Paul, no wooing local factions and unreliable client states. German diplomats delivered the message that if Mussolini would give up on his neutrality pact and all its potential complications for Germany's acquisition of the resources of the Balkans, then Italy would have all the coal she required. Reports state that Mussolini assured the German diplomats that their offer would receive his government's full attention. Following that comes news from the Allies. As war between the Soviet Union and Finland grew ever closer, the Allies considered the problem of supplying the Finns. The Northern Passage, while direct, was perilously close to the Arctic Morgana fleet. Worse so, it ran the risk of inviting Soviet attacks on Allied shipping. Consequently, the Allies resolved on overland transit through Norway and Sweden, which offered some tantalizing possibilities if it could be arranged. But that wasn't the opportunistic... Pro but that wasn't the only opportunistic possibility the Allies were eyeing. Italy was in an alliance with Germany, but her economy was her greatest weakness. Already the blockade was beginning to tell, and it was decided that now was the time to strike a deal that might detach Italy from Hitler. The Allies encouraged Italian neutrality by expanding commerce. The deal offered was British call for Italian-made airplanes and weaponry. In response, Mussolini assured the Allied delegates that the offer would receive his government's full attention. A final note, the Polish submarine O.R.P. Ozor surfaced after a long and heroic transit off the coast of Scotland. Damage, worn, in need of repairs, but still full of fight. Reports state that we may very well see O.R.P. Ozor join the ranks of the Royal Navy and serve alongside them in the near-term future. After that comes news from the common turn. It was a fact among the members of the Comintern that if war with Finland was to come to pass, then it fell to the Comintern to ensure that the correct set of facts were presented to the world at large. The USSR had evidence that the Finns had been receiving technology from the Morgana for weeks, exactly the kind of behavior the new League resolution explicitly condemned. It could certainly be argued that the Morgana were sharing their weapons, specifically to weaken the Soviet Union, and dealings with the invader could not be tolerated in a neighbor with such close proximity to the major cities of the Soviet Union. The question was then raised, in a situation such as this, was war not then deemed by national preservation? Of course, it is likely that every coastal nation on Earth had Morgana technology that they were trying to turn to their own ends, and many may even have come to certain agreements or arrangements with individual Morgana. The commenter would have to make sure that their arguments didn't provoke unintended consequences. Following the announcements from the world's factions comes news from Italy, who, totaling three continual months now, remains as the world's leading nation in combating the Morgana threat. They've clearly shown where their convictions lie through blood, sweat, and tears alone. 
We here at the League not only congratulate the Italians, but encourage them to continue their efforts against the Morgana. This week, the Italians had developed a network of informants in the ports of the Red Sea and environs. And although there had not been any losses in neutral shipping, there were many accounts of Morgana activity near the Seychelles. On the 24th of November, Ariana Eritrea left Mogadishu under orders and on the war plan eyes on the Gulf of Aden in order to investigate these accounts and cautiously assess the conditions of the islands. The waters were curiously empty of Morgana activity, and Port Victoria was found to be undamaged by Morgana attack. However, as Ariana Eritrea steamed back on the 28th, her lookouts noticed a disturbance on the horizon, similar to a fatter Morgana mirage. As it developed, it became clear that there was a very large Morgana fleet over the horizon, traveling in a generally northward direction. Eritrea immediately increased speed in Radio Divisione Balsamo. Roughly an hour later, she encountered the French sloop Bougainville and signaled her to retreat. The French ship's lower speed caused her to be left behind, however. Meanwhile, at home, the Italian battle fleet returned to Naples, declining the chance to engage the Morgana that destroyed La Maddalena. The rest was as welcome as it was necessary, but the appearance of an idle fleet nonetheless soured some of the triumph found in the Alboran Sea. The presence of the fleet did mean that the Tyrrhenian Sea was patrolled and defended, however. Unfortunately, reports of vanity activity in the Aegean Sea proved to be well-founded. A vanity fleet surprised the Greeks at dawn on November 29th, boldly engaging both the Greek fleet at Salamis and their coastal defenses at Piraeus. I don't know where as the Greek ships might have been destroyed, except that the vanities had come for another purpose. They methodically eliminated the shore guns defending the city of Athens and began bombarding the barracks, airfields, and especially the Italian consulate over a period of three hours. The attack culminated with a red-haired vanity dragging a hole down the avenue Andrea Sindru to reach the newly established Italian cultural mission. It is reported that she toured the building even as the Greek army engaged her with artillery and anti-tank guns before she destroyed it utterly. She herself expired shortly after, leaving a long trail of wreckage and an empty hulk in the center of Athens. Facing an increasingly stiff resistance from the Greek fleet, her sisters departed afterward, sailing south. In the wake of the attack, the Greeks rescinded permission for a cultural mission in any coastal city. The Turks followed suit shortly after. Following that comes news from Germany, the second leading nation in combating the Morgana threat. Late in the month of November, the order came to halt merchant traffic in the western Baltic Sea, right up to the Kattegat. Much to the frustration of Sweden and Norway, whose commercial traffic was not spared, sources say. The Chancellery suggested that the halting would be of short duration only, a week or two at most, and had to be done due to a large number of British mines that were drifting into the lanes. German diplomats conceded that the timing and communication could have been improved, but that German merchantmen were not exempt from the order. Rumors aboard ships were that it was done in preparation for operations in the North Sea, possibly an attack on France or Britain. Certainly, the fleet was ready for a significant operation. All leave was cancelled, stores laid in, and steam maintained from November 29th onwards. The involvement of the Anna Erba Abtelung für Werderkunde Geophysik who came aboard with cargo on several destroyers, was a complete mystery, however. Complicating matters still further was the Morgana Mistrust, who continued drifting in and out of sight, just out of range of German guns. The Kriegsmarine was instructed to treat her as a nuisance rather than a threat, as long as she didn't act aggressively, and the orders were somewhat grudgingly obeyed. Meanwhile, the North Sea, which had been boiling with Morgana over the past few weeks, seemed to reach a new tempo, Heavy concentrations were reported by scouting flights in a rough curved line from the Netherlands to the mouth of Skagerrak. And a final note, on November 28th, certain Kriegsmarine officers deemed responsible for the Polish submarine Orzel's escape were executed after a short trial. It was stated that their actions were treasonous to the German government, and that anyone else who willingly colludes with the enemy or otherwise will meet the same fate. After that, we head across the Atlantic to hear the latest from the third contributing nation to our united front, the United States, who recently suffered a heartbreaking attack. On November 27, 1939, the USS Constitution was assassinated by bomb in Philadelphia. Prior to this attack, USS Constitution had received minor damage from a dead torpedo, or rather, a torpedo she had neutralized two days prior and put in for repairs. 
Amid the crowds of civilian carpenters and crafters who had come to offer assistance had been an unemployed construction worker and veteran of the Great War named Vernon Holland Scholl. As USS Constitution was sailing down the Delaware Strait with the craftsmen aboard, an enormous explosion broke her keel and tore out a large section of her bottom. Scholl did not survive the detonation that sunk the ship, and after the Navy began their investigation, his sons came forward with a suicide note that Scholl had left in his garage. According to this note, Scholl believed that USS Constitution was trying to trick the country into sending young men and women to fight at sea on behalf of the Soviet Union, and he meant to act to protect his own sons from that immoral fate by destroying her. Based on a ream of notes found on his property, Scholl may have been in contact with a Morgana sabotage via a radio found in his home. He was known, regardless, to be mentally unstable before the incident, and given reports of the psychological powers Morgana could exert, it was considered possible that he was not acting entirely of his own free will. There were no signs of explosive manufacture in his home, and if he was indeed the assassin, it's unclear what explosive was used or how it was brought aboard. No surviving witnesses recalled any contractor bringing aboard anything larger than a standard-sized tool bag. Other possibilities include anarchists, a missed torpedo embedded in a hull, and INPF personnel. Some suspicion was levied upon a French national named Marie France Savary. She has not been interviewed by law enforcement or Congress at this time, however. Franklin Delano Roosevelt made it clear that the U.S. held sedition responsible beyond all others, and his statements matched the angry, bellicose mood of the nation. In his speech addressing the bombing, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, quote, Constitution was a symbol of the United States, a ship with a storied history, and a bell whose strength had time and again sent the Morgana fleeing in desperation and terror. Her death at the hands of a madman and a coward was an injustice that could not fully be corrected. However, her killers, the Morgana sedition, who has fed our populace lies and deceit, will certainly meet justice of another type. One only the people of America could deliver. They struck us in our home, and we will strike them back." End quote. During the incident, USS Constitution herself had ensured the safety of her crew and civilian guests after the explosion, and was observed to fade away as the ship slipped under. Her hulk is currently lying on the bottom of the Delaware Strait, with her mast still proudly flying the stars and stripes well above the surface. Of the bell, no further sign has come. Elsewhere in the Pacific, the Pacific Fleet, low on ammunition after heavy fighting near Formosa, accepted a Japanese escort back to Manila following the self-appointed war plan, Japanese hospitality. Even as the event signaled improved relations with the Empire of Japan, photographs of the Pacific Battle Line being escorted by the Imperial Japanese Navy was seen as a humiliation. The images seemed to support a sense that the U.S. Navy was reeling under the pressure of the Morgana assaults in the Pacific. That said, security provided by the fleet train in the Pacific had the additional benefit of increasing the trade flowing, especially westward, lending more oil and scrap iron for Japan. Following that, we take a hop across the pond to hear news from the United Kingdom, the fourth contributing member against the Morgana threat. With their recent successes in the Pacific and their attention seemingly focused more on home, it was a bit of a surprise when Prime Minister Menzies received word that the fourth cruisers had been dispatched to assist the Australian station with the Morgana and the Australian Bight. He seemed more than happy and accepted them with a certain amount of relief, or perhaps a great deal of relief, expressed with a particularly Australian kind of restraint. Reports of despair sightings were becoming increasingly common, and the station would be much more capable with additional cruisers. Meanwhile, the Houses of Parliament convened to discuss their latest proposal, with the majority of members from both houses being in agreement on continuing to focus their efforts in the Pacific. The proposal passed with 84% support, and the war plan returned to Hong Kong was announced and enacted by the Prime Minister later that evening. The 21st Destroyer Flotilla, who had joined the Japanese and the Americans in the Battle of Formosa, sped back to Hong Kong as quickly as they could following their new orders. Delusion wasn't there waiting for them, but her aircraft were. The island and surrounding territories were fortified as much as possible against air raids and surface attack, as much as local ordnance would allow. Delusion was spotted in Dia Bay on November 28th, but seemed to fade into the mist even as scout observers radioed for help. In European waters, the Morgana had begun forming concentrated groups on a rough curved line from the Netherlands to Skagerrak. On the one hand, it did an effective job of blockading Germany, 
But on the other, it was a significant threat to the British coast, and it was undeniable that these waters had become much less safe with their presence. Over in the Atlantic, a Sin fleet made its way towards Ireland, and in the Mediterranean, the Aegean Morgana, displaced by a raging vanity, found a new home in the Gulf of Sidra. Finally, on November 28th, the Polish submarine Orzel arrived in Scotland. She had made a long journey through enemy waters, without radio or navigation aids, to join the Allies. She had a kind word to spare for certain German officers, and promised to shake hands with them when Hitler was overthrown. Poland restored, and the war won. Following that, we head over to the Pacific with the Empire of Japan, who is the fifth-ranking nation contributing to the Morgana war effort. Having won their battle in the East China Sea, and having secured their bridgeheads into China, the Imperial Japanese Navy had found themselves time to regroup, but also a unique opportunity. The United States Pacific Fleet, who had aided in the Battle of Formosa, were low on supply and would need an escort in order to cross the Pacific unscathed. Whether they saw this as a diplomatic opportunity or a chance to honor the American fleet coming to their aid, 78% of captains of the Imperial Japanese Navy agreed upon the war plan escort mission, subsequently offering the ammunition-starved American fleet escort from Formosa back to safe harbor in the Philippines. The American captains graciously accepted their offer. Anyone witnessing the might of the Japanese Second Fleet, led by IJN Nagato, arranged in columns on either side of the American battleships, could not help but be awed by the sight. The two fleets departing key run, as captured by photograph, were on the front page of every newspaper worldwide by the end of the week. Perhaps this was emblematic of the new era that the Emperor and Kasumi had wrought at the Yokosuka Naval Arsenal weeks before. The mighty American fleet being protected by the Emperor's hand had an appropriately mythic quality, as prearranged, the British left port just after the two great fleets sunk below the horizon, but their destination was to the southwest. As the two fleets made the crossing, every local Morgana that had been tempted to slip back into the Philippine Sea suddenly found better places to be, although that did not stop a few enterprising asphyxiations from making an attempt on what was a very tempting target. They were all driven off or sunk by the Imperial Japanese Navy. When the Japanese arrived at Manila, they found a wildly enthusiastic reception from the local population. Even the notoriously strict discipline of the Imperial Navy could be relaxed for a day or two. However, delusion still prowled the South China Sea. On one day, she was seen in the distance from the Daya Bay, the next shouting in Portuguese at fishing boats from Mao Ming in the apparent belief that she was at Macau. Her worst attacks fell on Haiko on November 26th, however. Fourteen people were killed, and her collectors gathered hundreds of kilos of shattered glass for reasons no one could seem to guess. What was certain was that the South China Sea was growing mistier, and the fishermen spoke of shifting currents and fogs that came down like a curtain, which were lifted just as suddenly. Meanwhile, in mainland China, the army entered Nanning on the 26th. Reports indicate that much of the city was destroyed, and the dead and wounded civilians were too numerous to count. In particular, indiscriminate air attacks by the Imperial Japanese Army Air Service were of significant part of the collapse of the 16th Root Army under General Tsai Ting Kai's command, who had famously held the Japanese at Shanghai for six weeks. But now it's looking more likely than ever that they won't hold against the next offensive. Following that comes news from the Soviet Union, the sixth contributing nation to our united front. On November 26th, Orders came direct from Moscow, enacting the war plan, Break the Chain, Stray of Tartary, ordering for a joint effort between captains of the Pacific Fleet and aviators from the VVS to defeat the Morgana in the Strait of Tartary. Following the directive, the Amur River Flotilla set out from Kavarovsk to meet the Petropavlovsk submarines, while on the 27th, Stalin and Voikov sortied from Sovgavon with additional submarine elements joining them from Vladimir Bay. Thus, as state, the intention was for the aircraft of the Pacific Fleet to bomb the Morgana in the afternoon of the 28th, while the northern submarines steamed close to prepare an ambush by night. The faster ships of the flotilla would lure them to the submarine gauntlet and the waiting monitors the following morning, with another airstrike promised. To the south, Stalin's fleet would wait until the Morgana were engaged to sever the chain and attack the enemy from behind. Submarines would be positioned along their path to attack in case they needed to retire, or if the Morgana fled in this direction. 
The first hint of disaster was engine troubles in the monitor Lennon, which delayed the progress of the flotilla by several hours. They hit several underwater snags as well, which caused further delay in their progress. By the afternoon of the 28th, a miscommunication had started the air attacks, but the river flotilla was not yet in position. A further misunderstanding caused the northern submarine group to sail closer than planned to the chain to set up their ambush, while to the south, Stalin's fleet retired southward. It was in this chaos that a corruption detected L-10 and began a depth charge attack. L-7 and L-11 torpedoed the corruption, but by that time the enemy was alerted to their presence. By midday on the 29th, L-8 and L-11 had been lost, and it was only due to the presence of the river flotilla, finally in position at the mouth of the river, that the other submarines were able to escape. Without the benefit of their submarines, the flotilla chose to retire under the guns at the river mouth. A final airstrike closed the campaign, and Stalin's fleet returned to Sovgavan. In the end, the chain remained, and reconnaissance reports stated something was being built on the Sakhalin. Command of the river mouth did allow the further fortification along the banks. These defenses may yet prove decisive that the Morgana make a determined attack on the river. Meanwhile, in the Baltic, the fleet spent the week repairing, provisioning, and preparing for battle. War with Finland was imminent, with new rumors of Finnish Morganic collusion spreading by the day. Whatever that may bring, the Navy would be ready. Lastly, we head over to Western Europe to hear news from France, the seventh contributing member to the war against the Morgana. Following their successes in the Balearic Sea, the reported Morgana sightings around Madagascar from months prior piqued the interest of the Latier's government, and as such, they enacted the war-planned Madagascar questions, which passed with a 78% majority. Upon receiving radioed orders to scout towards Madagascar, MN Bougainville steamed south from her position off the coast of Italian East Africa on November 24th, cruising toward the Seychelles at her best speed. At first, there was no particular danger encountered. She reported a half-broken delusion spinning in circles east of Mogadishu, two dismays chasing each other listlessly in open water and a few unusual squalls of short duration. Just at the limits of her range, on November 28th, she reported encountering the Italian sloop RN Eritrea, who was steaming northwards at flank speed and urgently signaling Bougainville to reverse course due to a Morgana fleet over the horizon. She immediately complied and began transmitting her position to the Indian Ocean Station. She continued to do so for the next half hour before her transmissions became gobbled and finally lost. Her fate is currently unknown. Meanwhile, in Paris, a very particular fear was cohering, that the Morgana had found a way to intercept and crack coded Allied transmissions, and had thereby been able to seize the initiative on the seas. Under such conditions, sharing intelligence with the British seemed impossible. After the debacle of Venlo, it seemed increasingly certain that the British were compromised. The intelligence team at PC Bruno had said as much, and now the Allies would need a new framework if continued intelligence sharing was to occur. On a more positive note, confidence was rising that French codes were increasingly inaccessible to the Germans, as evidenced by a sharp reduction in attacks in the Bay of Biscay. Neither Morgana nor U-boats were finding much success hunting there. And with that concludes the League of Nations War Report for this intermediary week between November and December. The actions of the Morgana is quite concerning and likely indicate that both medium and large-scale attacks are just over the horizon. We urge all nations out there to remain extra vigilant and to prepare for the coming storm that's likely to strike in the next few weeks. And as a reminder to all captains and citizens alike that this League of Nations broadcast is intended on keeping you informed about the unified war effort against the Morgana. But there is more you can do than just listen. Consider donating some much-needed war bonds to help our boys and girls on the ocean stay afloat so they can finish the job. Doing so will net you prestige among your peers that you captains can utilize to gain more resources, stock and harbor space, and personnel for your own war efforts so that you too can continue fighting the good fight in your own way. Thank you for listening, and may you have smooth seas.